I'm really excited to be here today to kick off such a historic event, the Making Oregon Count 2020 Symposium. Thank you. And I, I wanted to take a quick moment to thank the Population Research Center and the incredible team led by um, Director Jason Georgievich um, for putting together such an amazing event for all of us to come together, even for a little bit, and nerd out about the census. The decennial census is the foundation of our democracy and an integral component to making sure that families across Oregon have the resources that they need to thrive, as well as the representation that, to have their voices heard in Washington, D.C. In only a couple of months, 126 days to be exact, or 18 Taco Tuesdays, Oregonians will begin to hear about how they can participate in the census and its importance. The upcoming census comes with several unique challenges. And these challenges we will have to work around to make sure that we have an accurate, a fair, and a complete census count in Oregon. Our success in this endeavor will determine whether or not our schools, our hospitals, and our roads will be ad adequately funded over the next decade. For almost a year now, a couple of us have been building a team of outstanding leaders from across the state to prepare for the Oregon 2020 census, kind of like the Avengers, the Oregon Census Avengers. <laughs> Faith leaders, tribal leaders, local governments, state agencies, philanthropic organizations, and community-based organizations have come together as the first ever Oregon Complete Count Committee to help think through how we will come together as a state and count every single Oregonian. Now, I'd like to introduce to you um, our next speaker and one of the most important members of the Oregon Census Avengers, Attorney General Ellen Rosenblum. Attorney General Rosenblum has been an unwavering champion for the integrity of the census, and in 2018 joined a coalition of 18 AGs across the country that uh, filed a lawsuit to block the citizens' question for being added in the 2020 census questionnaire. Thank you. As a, as a DACA recipient, this means a lot, and I am grateful for her leadership. We are happy to have Attorney General Rosenblum on our corner, and we'll look to her leadership to help us maintain, uh, to help us dispel fear and misinformation about the census so that we can have a complete count. Please join me in welcoming Attorney General Emily Rosenblum. Thank you so much, Aldo, for that kind introduction. And welcome and thank you for being here today. And thank you to PSU for putting on this really important event and all those with the census uh, who are here to talk with all of us and for us to learn and make sure that we have a complete count. That's what this is all about. But first, I want to just add something especially for Aldo, uh, but for all of our 11,000 DACAs in Oregon, we're all thinking of you especially today. We have you in our hearts. Today is the day that the United States Supreme Court is hearing the DACA case, and we are with you, and we are so hopeful that they will do the right thing because you are our treasures, so thank you. Oregon is growing fast. Ours is one of the most popular states for in-migration. From the time of the last census in 2010 through 2018, we have welcomed almost 360,000 new Oregonians. That's approximately half of Portland, more than two Eugenes, four Bens, 360 Josephs. We are lucky to live in a state people want to move to. We're lucky to be able to welcome these newcomers. And that's because we benefit from their talents and their businesses, their work ethic, and the diversity they bring to Oregon. It is also true, however, that with growth come challenges. A larger population means a greater need for services. Since the last census, Oregon has received $13.4 billion in federal funding. But as large as that number may sound, I doubt there's anyone in this room who will say that we have too much money for schools. Too much money for infrastructure. Too much money for food banks and shelters. Too much money for health care needs. And this is why it's simply essential that we count every Oregonian. It's so we can maintain and hopefully increase those funds and the programs they support. So we must make sure our count reflects all who have continued to live here 
as well as those 360,000 plus people who have moved to Oregon since the last census. What's more, based on Oregon's population growth, we stand to gain another congressional seat, expanding our voice in Washington. People flock to Oregon because ours is a thriving state, a state that values people and the environment, a state that's in the forefront of so many important humanitarian initiatives. We are a beacon to the country, and we must continue to make our voices heard. That begins with the voice of every single Oregonian as they are counted on the census. That is why we must reach all our communities and ask them to stand up and be counted. From Malheur County to Clatsop County, from Curry County to Wallowa, and every point in between, we must count every Oregonian in the cities, on the farms, in high rises, on the streets, documented, undocumented, young and old, every race, every religion, every gender, every Oregonian counts. In some ways, it's actually pretty easy to complete the census, right? We can do it online, by mail, even over the phone. The census is printed in English and Spanish with an additional 13 language translations available on the phone and online. But just because the form arrives in the mail with easy to check boxes does not mean that it's easy for everyone. The 18 year old receiving the census was eight the last time it arrived in the mail. Perhaps their parents sat them down and explained that the census is an important civic duty, but maybe they didn't, or maybe they forgot. And now they could be off at school, right, in another town. And that's right, college kids have to fill out the census wherever they are. Maybe they were taught to be suspicious of unsolicited requests for information, telephone solicitors, and spam, aren't we all? Maybe they were told never to disclose personal information. That's not the only reason one might not fill out the census. It's not easy to fill out the census if you don't have a place to receive mail, if you can't read, if you work three jobs, your child is sick, and you don't have time for one more thing, or if you're afraid of the government, of being noticed, of being targeted because of the very <coughs> kinds of information the census asks you to provide. And yes, Thank you, Aldo. I'm very proud that Oregon was part of the lawsuit that we won in the United States Supreme Court, keeping the citizenship question off the census. But that is not enough to alleviate all the fears. We need to address those fears. We need to make sure census forms are filled out as soon as they are made available, online or in the mail, so as to avoid receiving a home visit from the census taker. That actually should not be necessary if we can persuade people and make sure that they know that they should fill the form out immediately. Here's what's really important. These inequities and injustices are the very inequities and injustices that we can combat by counting every Oregonian and getting the funding and representation that we need to support our people. And you are a vital part of that effort. So please, urge your communities to participate. Identify your community's influencers. That's a word I learned recently. <laughs> Those influencers could be one of your kids' soccer coaches or your clergy. Enlist their help. Go to where the people are. Maybe it is the soccer field up the street or the church or the mosque around the corner. Educate people about the census, what it is and why it matters. Work for the census and encourage people in your communities to take jobs as census workers. If we're on the ground, reaching our people in our communities, supporting their participation in the census, then they will be more likely to participate. The census is a vital part of civic life. It is also a symbol of what we strive to be as a community. And that's why it's so important that each and every one get counted. So together, we will have a complete count and we will leave no one out, not the newborn baby who I saw in the picture there, not the college student, not those turning 100 years old this year, everyone in between. We will count each and every individual, and you, by being here today, are ensuring that that will happen. So thank you so much for having me and spending the day on this very, very important project. Thank you. OK. Um, our next speaker um, began his journey with the Census Bureau in 1984 as a supervisory survey statistician in the Kansas City office. Please join me in welcoming Assistant Regional Census Manager from the LA Regional Census Center, Michael Hall.
Good morning and welcome. I'd like to say, first of all, uh, I was two years old when I started working for the Census Bureau. That's my line and I will not switch from it. I've said it so long, I believe it. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you all for being here today. Let me ask you a question. How many of you listen to station WIIFM? WIIFM. Everybody. But you ever look at me this blank look, you ought to see your faces. You can see how you're looking at me right now. It stands for What's In It For Me. <laughs> Everybody listens to that station. So, as the Attorney General has said, how important the census is to, to the state and to everyone here and how much your growth is out here, you've got to identify those trusted leaders, yourselves and other trusted leaders throughout the state who are going to go in and make sure you fine tune what station WIIFM is for every individual that you go. Is it the soccer field? Is it the faith-based community? Is it, on the, is it at the, the city sending out notices in the water bills? Is it some notices wherever you can get the trusted word out? Community-based organizations on it. Now, the, the, the Attorney General also mentioned about jobs, okay? Now, we have projected for the seven, excuse me, seven state area for, that we have for the, uh, the Los Angeles region that we need to recruit approximately 400,000 people to work for the census temporarily. But guess what? You all are going to prove them wrong. And how are you going to prove them and tell them we don't need that many people? Because you're going to do such a great job of getting everybody to respond to the census when that form first comes out or that notice comes out for them to go online and have them actually fill it out and participate in the census. Now, let's be realistic. My dad is 90 years old and my mom is 85. They ain't filling out no census online. I can tell you that. I barely can get them to look at the iPad to look at their grandkids' pictures, okay? So I know they ain't going on no census to go online. But I've already talked to my brother who's going to go over there and help mom and dad to make sure they fill out the form. Just in case he doesn't do that, I'm also told mom and dad there's an 800 number. I will give them the number. Even if I have a three-way in for them and call for them, three 800 number, for them to call in and report. And just in case that doesn't work, they're going to get a form mailed to them. So by having a form mailed in, my mom filled it out if it's mailed into it. My dad like, honey, baby, you need to fill that out. Because that job's, you know, that's important. That's what Michael do for a living, so you need to make sure you fill it out. So he will push my mom to do that. So whatever it takes to get people participating. So let me just say, what can you as an individual do to promote the census? I got my feelings hurt in the 2000 census when I was at, when I was at uh, at church telling some people about the importance of the census. They're like, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, okay. Pastor got up there and said about the importance of the census and put his extra little spin on some of the talking points I gave. It took me 45 minutes to get out of the parking lot to get home that day because everybody wanted to talk to me about the census because it came from the pastor. <laughs> and finally, I got a little attitude and said, who you think gave pastor his talking points? <laughs> okay. so, Trusted voices go a long way in getting things done on the census. So I just want to let you make sure that I stress to you that it's safe, secure. We want to count everyone once, only once, and in the right place. And this is going to be the best census ever because, let me just end with this, because I know time is fleeing here and we got quite a bit on the agenda. My mom, when her health was better, used to cook lemon meringue pies. I'm talking about the meringue so high that when she pulled it out of the oven, she burned the tip on it, because lemon meringue pie is very light, okay? She gonna cook three or four lemon meringue pies. My older brother, God knows I love him, but he would always make sure he got more pieces of lemon meringue pie than I did every year for Christmas. Even if I cut a piece, took it out of the pan, put it in something else, hid it behind the milk and everything else, he still would find that extra lemon meringue pie. All my mama cared was that her lemon rain pie was going to get eaten, everybody was going to enjoy it, okay? The government will allocate at least $675 billion every <coughs> year based on the census count. That's what it'll be every year. Don't let my big brother eat up your part of $675 billion 
because you're not counting this up, and we miss you. We miss you for the next <laughs> 10 years, okay? So it's very important that you get the word out. Every sense is local. Jason's gonna get the hook on me any second. So I thank you very much for your time and, and let you hear the real speaker. My former boss, John Thompson, <laughs> will be up to give you to be a keynote speaker. So thank you very much, and I'll be around for any questions you may have. Thank you now. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. I'm Jason Jurgovich, Director of the Population Research Center here at Portland State. Um, I want to start out with thank yous this morning because I've got a number of thank yous to, uh, to, uh, to, to make. Uh, first off, the Census Equity Funder Committee of Oregon. Uh, they've led this, a lot of uh, efforts around Census 2020 from the beginning, and this event would not be possible without the funding support from the Census Equity Funder Committee of Oregon. Um, and it's uh, these organizations here, which are a coalition uh, of phil philanthropic organizations across the Portland Metro. In particular, I want to thank um, Carly Brown, Carol Cheney, Aaron Dysart, Lauren Godfordson, Amanda Whalen, and Jesse Beeson. If we could just give Sethco a big round of applause. Thank you so much. Um, I also want to thank uh, folks at the Population Research Center that have made this event possible, uh, in particular Julia Michelle, Matt Cunningham, Matt Cunningham uh, for the fabulous work in pulling this event together, as well as Nick Chun, Charles Reinerson, Kevin Rancic, Deborah Loftus, Randy Morris, and Paul Rungi from uh, PRC. So if you could also give them a round of applause as well. We're grateful, we're grateful also to our partners at the federal, uh, our federal partners at the U.S. Census Bureau, um, and as well as folks from the governor's office, Aldo Solano. Uh, this has been a great partnership uh, to this point over the past year, year and a half, in terms of getting the resources together uh, to be able to ensure that everybody is counted here in Oregon. Um, and so uh, I also want to finally thank uh, Director Thompson, Attorney General uh, Rosenblum, and all morning panelists and afternoon presenters, thank you for being here today for this, uh, this critically important event. I wanna tell you a little bit uh, this morning um, why I'm here and why I pushed for this event, which is the, uh, the first, to my knowledge, the first event uh, kicking off the census here in Oregon. Um, this was a, an idea that I had seen other states uh, do um, in the early part of 2019 and back in 2018. And, um, and I was noticing uh, just great results from these events, these kickoff events that were committing the state, its communities, to ensuring a fair and accurate count. Also at the same time, um, I got a request back in March of 2019 from Black Press USA. And uh, the, the gentleman that, um, that contacted me in late March, his name was Stacy Brown, and he asked me to provide some information underscoring, in particular, why it's important for African Americans to participate in the census, particularly given that African Americans are an undercounted group in the census. Um, and if we think about, and many, some of you have heard this story before, but Census 2010 was one of the most accurate censuses in recent American history. Uh, we had virtually a net zero undercount across the country. Um, but of course, when the data are disaggregated by race, ethnicity, by age, by nativity, by renter status, we start to see that we miss people, unfortunately. And there are people who are not counted. And so even though it was one of the most accurate overall, folks, uh, including African Americans, were missed. And the statistic that I've been, many of you have heard me cite before, is 2.1%. 2.1% of African Americans were missed in the 2010 census, which represents 800,000 African Americans across the United States. And so I use those statistics in this article and Stacy Brown uh, quoted me in the article and it was disseminated to historically black newspapers across the country, uh, including uh, the scanner here in Portland. And uh, shortly after that article was disseminated, uh, I received a letter in the mail. Handwritten or hand typed letter from Texas, and this is the big introduction to the letter. I'm writing you uh, after reading an article in the Houston Defender 
On April 4th, in which you said for all to count, all of them must be counted, you said 1.5% of Hispanics and 2% of African Americans were undercounted. I am here to confirm what you say is true. The letter goes on. I'm a 74-year-old African American who has never been counted in the census. And to the best of my knowledge, in all these years of filling out a questionnaire, I have never had anybody knock at my door requesting information, nor can I find information on previous census records relating to myself and including folks that Mr. William, his family, when he goes to the publicly available census records from 1940 and earlier, he can't find his family members in the decennial census. So he concludes, this got me to thinking how this is possible in all these years, not one record of me being counted. I decided to write you in case some folks say your information is incorrect. Thank you for your attention. This is why we're here. We are here to make sure that everybody in this country is counted in the census as the bed bedrock of our democracy. We have a lot of work to do ahead of us prior to early March. And this is one example of why I think that this event is so important and why I'm so delighted that you are all here. So thank you for being here today. Um, really appreciate it. And I'm grateful to Mr. William as well for sharing his story. So it's my distinct honor to introduce this morning's plenary speaker, former director of the US Census Bureau, John Thompson. John Thompson was sworn in as the 24th Census Bureau Director on August 8th, 2013, and he served in that role until 2017. Director Thompson joined the Census Bureau in 1975, working in the Statistical Methods Division until 1987. He then moved to, uh, from 1995 to 2002, he served as the Chief of the Decennial Management Division and Associate Director of the 2000 Census. Uh, Direct, former Director Thompson also served as, as the Executive Vice President and then President and CEO of uh, NORC, previously known as the National Opinion Research Center at the University of Chicago from 2002 to 2013. A longtime leader in the social science research community, Thompson is an elected fellow of the American Statistical Association and past chair of the social, science, social statistics section and committee on fellows. He holds a bachelor's degree and master's degree in mathematics from Virginia Tech. We are very fortunate here this morning to have uh, former Director Thompson joining us to share his perspective and the work ahead of us on the 2000 census. So please join me in welcoming the former director of the Census Bureau, John Thompson. folks that are really, really enthusiastic about the 2020 census. Um, I'm pretty enthusiastic about it too, um, having been the director. So a lot of what I'm gonna say you probably already heard, <clears throat> but it doesn't hurt, I think, to emphasize it. So why is the census important? Well, it's the cornerstone of our democracy. It's in Article I, Section Two of the Constitution. It's one of the few data collection activities that are in the Constitution. And it's right at the front of the Constitution, so the framers understood the importance of getting a good count and allocating uh, uh, resources. Um, so it's used for reapportioning the Congress every 10 years. It's used for drawing uh, local districts and congressional districts. Um, over $900 billion of federal funding is allocated every year based on the census. Um, and, and it's essential for, for local planning, state planning, tribal government planning. Uh, businesses use it to decide where to invest. Um, and finally, uh, this, this isn't very well known, but the census is carried forward every year in the form of population estimates. And these are used to control and make representative virtually every uh, demographic survey that's conducted in the United States. And that includes federal and private. When I was at the National Opinion Research Center, we used the census data to make our surveys representative. And 
These surveys go well beyond the $900 billion that's allocated based on the census alone. There's a lot of health surveys that are, that are conducted. There are business surveys that are conducted. The American Community Survey is conducted. Um, and if those surveys aren't representative, then the effect of a bad census goes a lot further than just the census. And you are stuck with the results of the census for 10 years. That's why it's so important to get it right. Uh, the decennial census is consistent. It's been taken every 10 years since 1790. Um, it's always included more information than just the head count. And except for 1920, the census has been used to reapportion to Congress every time. There's a long story about 1920, which we don't have time to go into. Um, a couple legal uh, dates in the census. So by December 31st, the Census Bureau has to produce the counts for apportionment. Those are 50 numbers, one for each state, which includes all the residents of the state, plus the overseas federal and civilian uh, workforce. Um, the president will usually deliver these numbers to the Congress after the census. However, there are some legal opinions, and I've cited one, that the president has a little leeway when he gets those 50 numbers from the Secretary of Commerce. So uh, it, it might be a really interesting time in December of 2020 when we see what the president does with those numbers. Yeah. Um, and by, uh, by March uh, 31st of two, 2021, the Census Bureau has to complete delivering to every state the data for redistricting. Uh, a couple other things about the census law. First off, uh, it, it really uh, maintains that the census data is confidential. There are really, really serious fines and penalties if a census employee or a former census employee were to reveal um, confidential data. Census employees take a, an oath for life to never reveal personal information. And the law also Im implies that when the Census Bureau puts out its publications, the publications can't in identify individuals or individual characteristics. Um, the other thing is that the census is also mandatory. You are required by law to respond to the census. Now, the Census Bureau is not going to go and find people or lock people up for not responding. That's not what the Census Bureau is about. And in fact, the Census Bureau has no enforcement authority. They're a statistical agency. Um, and they believe that the best way to get people to participate is to explain to them why the census is important to them and that it's safe. Um, there are, oh, okay, so why is it uh, important for, for Oregon? Well, as you've heard, Oregon stands to gain another seat and Oregon received over $13.5 billion in federal funding in 2016. So it, 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 it really means a lot to Oregon to get a good count. Um, so now a little bit of background on the census so I can explain to you what's going to be a little different about the 2020 census. So the census process from 1970 through 2010 was pretty simple. Um, you well, <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's easy to explain. It's hard to carry out. Um, so the idea was to prepare an address list, to mail a paper questionnaire to every household on the address list, most households on the address list, to capture the information off the mail returns, and then to conduct uh, an in-person enumeration of those that didn't self-respond or didn't mail back a questionnaire. And that operation was conducted by a paper and pencil. And what, what may have worked well in 1970 uh, became more and more strained uh, as the population of the United States got more diverse, the living arrangements got more diverse, uh, it, this, it just got more complicated in the United States. And the only thing you could do with the paper and pencil operation facing this, this growing complexity was to throw more bodies at it, hire more people, build more infrastructure. 
And that's why if you look at the cost of the census, you can see that it's gone up exponentially. It's gone up more rapidly than population growth and it's gone up more rapidly than inflation. And it's because of that paper and pencil based operation which required more and more people. So for the 2020 census, the idea was to re-engineer the census. And there were four basic ways to re-engineer the census, which dealt with the address list development, the self-response, using administrative records in different ways for the first time, and re-engineering the field operations. I'll talk about each one of those. But one thing, and I'll talk about this really important, that, that hasn't changed and is, is still there is the Integrated Communications and Partnership Program, which started in the 2020, the, the 2000 census, continued in 2010, and is a big component of the 2020 census, and probably, I, in my opinion, the most important component, and I've got some data to show you why. So first off, talking about address, uh, canvassing or building the address list, um, before the 2020 census, the U.S. Census Bureau had to walk the entire country uh, shortly before the census to update the address list. But by using modern geospatial tools, the Census Bureau did a lot of the walking in an office environment so they didn't have to actually physically walk the whole United States. They estimated, and I believe it was about 30 to 35 percent of the streets would have to be walked. They completed that operation recently, and the automation that they used worked very, very well and introduced um, some serious efficiencies into the operation. So for the self-response, uh, the Census Bureau for the first time is offering the internet as the primary method of self-responding. Now, the Census Bureau also understands that not everybody um, has access to the internet or will fill it out by the internet. So they target about 80% of the United States to get a letter which will invite you to go online and, and respond. The other 20% will get a questionnaire in the mail that's called internet choice. So they can either fill out the paper questionnaire or they can, call, can, can uh, go on the internet or they can call in. Um, so this is the first census where they've actually, the Census Bureau has actually offered telephone as a, as a means to respond. Um, so this, this is the, the biggest introduction of efficiency into the Census Bureau. This is to re-engineer that non-response follow-up operation and to use automation. So the Census Bureau has been testing this. They were testing it when I was there and it was working well and I, and I, I understand it's working even better now than when I was there. And that is they're equipping the enumerators with smartphones. I believe they're iPhone 8s and they're equipping the supervisors of the enumerators with, um, with tablets. And this allows the introduction of mobile technology into the census process and gets real efficiencies. So you know if the enumerator has picked up their caseload, you know if the enumerator's in the wrong area, um, you optimize overnight the, the workload for the enumerators. Uh, it, it just has resulted in real efficiencies. I know in the test they did in Rhode Island, the end-to-end -end test, the, it worked 30 to 40 percent more efficiently than a paper and pencil non-response follow-up. So this is, this is introducing real efficiencies. Uh, the final innovation I want to talk about is new uses of administrative records. These are like tax records, social security records, other, other records that the federal government collects, and the Census Bureau has the authority to use by law. By law also, they can't release that data to anyone. Um, so in previous censuses, administrative records have been used. That's how the uh, overseas military were counted. The Census Bureau doesn't go cell to cell in most maximum, in maximum security prisons. They use the administrative records. They enumerate many college dorms using administrative records, long-term care facilities. The new use here is to reduce the non-response follow-up workload. And what that means is, is that after at least one visit, the Census Bureau will use um, administrative records to count 
some of the housing units. We're also going to count some of the vacant housing units using administrative records. Vacant housing units don't mail pack a form for the most part. Um, so it's, it's, it's not going to be a lot. It's maybe 3% of the, the, of the population of the United States will be counted this way. The important thing, people worry about administrative records not being representative of the hard to count populations. That's not what this is intended to do. It's intended to reduce the workload so that more resources can be applied to count the hard to count populations. So administrative records is not the solution for an undercount or, or things like that. It's the solution to reduce, re to save resources and apply them differently. Uh, so this, I think, was a major innovation that got introduced in the 2000 census. And this was the use of a paid advertising campaign combined with hiring a number of partnership specialists that could go work with a variety of local areas, including many of the, many of the organizations in Oregon, in Portland. Um, and the idea was to get out two messages. One, why the census is important, and the other one is that the census is confidential. And the Census Bureau uh, believed then and still believes that that can't, message can't come out from Washington, D.C. It's got to come out from trusted voices at a local level, either in a trusted media or by a trusted spokesperson for the Census Bureau. And now I have a little data to show you why that's important. So these are two maps of the United States. They're both on the same scale. The one on the left <laughs> is, uh, is, is what, what would happen if the 1990 census resulted in 2020, so this carried the population forward and looked at the 1990 census undercounts. The one on the right is the, tw the 2010 census undercount. These are at the county level, and they're both on the same scale. The only difference, well, I, the, the, the primary difference between the 1990 census and the 2000 census and the 2010 census was the combined advertising and partnership program. And I know that because I ran the 2000 census, and it's a long story, but we had to use the 1990 procedures to do the 2000 census. Um, and on that map, red is bad. <laughs> so you can see the dramatic difference in the level of undercounts at the county level and at the national level that resulted between those two censuses. And the 2000 census looks pretty much like the 2010 census. There's very little difference between them. So, for example, the undercount of Hispanics was 5% about in 1990. In 2000, or I'm sorry, in 2010, it was about a percent and a half, which isn't perfect, but it's a dramatic gain in, in accuracy. The same is true for the African-American populations. Uh, so, th this really does show why it's so important to get the word out about the census. Um, so, well, they've already talked about residence criteria. I won't talk about that very much. The, the, the census counts you at your usual residence as of April 1st. Uh, it's not that simple. They have a, a nice reference on their website that explains their residence rules, but for example, uh, everyone's counted, citizens, non-citizens, regardless of legal status. The Census Bureau doesn't ask legal status. Um, prisoners are counted in prisons. College students are counted at their college residence. And as I said, the overseas military and federal civilians are counted in the United States. Uh, the census is pretty basic. These are the questions that it asks. R name, race, Hispanic origin, age, date of birth, sex, relationship and tenure whether you own or rent. And then it has a couple operational questions which are designed to jog people's memory to make sure that they've included everyone on the, on the questionnaire. But it's a pretty short questionnaire and it's pretty simple. Um, I already talked about the two legal deadlines. And there's, there, this, the, this, this is a chart I have that shows the operations. There's much better charts in your pamphlet and at the back of the room about you know, what happened. The big, the big, the big things are that, that are going to come up will be 
the start of self-response, which is March 12th, and then the start of the non-response follow-up, which is um, uh, May, May 13th. Those are two critical dates for the Census Bureau. Um, the Census Bureau is also going to be making available um, the self-response rates at the census tract level on a daily basis during the, during the enumeration. So everyone can get those and look at it and see how their local area is doing in self-response and help the Census Bureau by getting up self-response in those areas that are falling behind. Um, so census funding. Right now, the census has good funding from both the House of Representatives and the Senate. Uh, the big deal is that they have to come to a resolution on those bills and get the president to sign it. And so the Census Bureau won't uh, be stuck with a continuing resolution. Uh, seven former directors wrote to the House and Senate appropriators stressing that the Census Bureau should not be under a continuing resolution. And if they really do, do get stuck in a continuing resolution, it will have a bad effect on the 2020 census because the Census Bureau needs to start spending a lot of money right now to build up and take the census. Uh, so maybe a little bit about the citizenship question. And in, in full disclosure, I was a consultant in two of the three lawsuits um, uh, against the citizenship question. And I, of course, was working for the plaintiffs. I wasn't a big fan of the citizenship question. Um, and it, it was very problematic. The citizenship question had never been tested in a contemporaneous census environment. And in fact, it, the way it was posed, it had never been asked before on, on a census. Um, there, there was a high risk that uh, undercounts would result because of the citizenship question. And that, that of course, meant serious underrepresentation. Um, so fortunately, uh, three federal judges uh, found that the citizenship question should not be asked and barred it. There are a number of reasons they did this. One of the major ones was um, that Secretary Ross had violated the Administrative Procedures Act, which meant he was arbitrary and capricious. So that went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court um, up upheld the violation of the Administrative Procedures Act and remanded it back to, the, 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 to New York. Um, the Supreme Court ruling was really, really important, though that the Secretary of Commerce can't be arbitrary and capricious. So if you look at the, at the Department of Commerce, they have the Census Bureau and they have the Bureau of Economic Analysis. They produce a lot of our national economic statistics and our demographic statistics. And if the Secretary of Commerce could be arbitrary and capricious. That means that any secretary going forward could change national statistics, like the unemployment rate, like the poverty rate, even gross domestic product. So that, that was just incredibly important to maintain the integrity of our national statistics to keep the Secretary of Commerce uh, honest. Well, at least not be arbitrary and capricious. Um, so <laughs> ultimately, uh, the Census Bureau um, the, 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 the uh, current administration decided not to uh, ask the census question. They were going to fight it for a while, and then they, the decision, they decided not to. They did order the Census Bureau to produce a data file using administrative records of citizen voting age population at the census block level that could be used for redistricting. That's in an executive order. Um, so there, there, are some, there are some issues that have been associated with the 2020 census. One of them was um, where to count prisoners. There was a, a big move to not count prisoners in prisons, but to count them where they were pre-incarceration. Um, historically, the Census Bureau has counted prisoners in prisons, and the decision for this census was to count them in prisons. Um, there are efforts to um, exclude illegal residents from apportionment. Uh, most people that I've talked to believe that the Constitution says you have to count everyone in the United States. However, uh, Alabama has sued to exclude um, 
illegal residents from apportionment, and we'll see how that suit turns out. Um, there's also tremendous concern over the production of the citizenship data file at, at the block level. Um, and there's a lawsuit in Maryland uh, about that that says the Census Bureau should not produce that file. Uh, MALDEF uh, is really the, the force behind that, that lawsuit. Uh, there are concerns also that uh, the internet response will, um, will, will negatively affect some communities that don't have access to the internet. Um, that's where partnership really comes in to help those communities. Um, there are concerns being expressed that the Census Bureau is not hiring enough partnership specialists because there's a lot of information that shows that concerns and fear of government is higher than it's been before, and so the Census Bureau should be applying more resources there. I, I'm, I'm not saying I believe those concerns and <laughs> disparaging our partnership specialists, but I'm just saying what some of the issues I've heard are. Um, and there are concerns that the Bureau is going to have difficulty in hiring enough people because of the economy. Um, there are some also some other uh, issues. Um, concerns. So the IT systems. This is a very automated census. There are concerns about will the IT work. Uh, it's been working well in testing. Uh, the Census Bureau says it's, and I believe them, that they believe that it's on schedule to be launched, but we won't know until it's actually launched. And that means when the self-response period opens, will the, will will the self-response scale to handle the work, the incoming uh, inflow of, of hits? The demand model they had when I was there was that there will be two million simultaneous hits on the Census Bureau's website. So we'll see what happens there. And then the non-response follow-up. That's a lot of automation. It has to work. It has to, to scale. And the question is, will it scale? And again, we won't really know that until they, they do the operation. But that's an issue. Cybersecurity has always been an issue with, with the Census. Um, and I think they're in good shape here. Um, they're, they're, when I was there, they were doing everything right, and they're still doing everything right. There is a new threat, though, and that's called disinformation campaigns. That's similar to what happened in the 2016 election, where there's a lot of disinformation spread to, um, about, about Hillary Clinton. Um, there are concerns that that, it, that will, same thing will happen for the 2020 census, that there'll be a lot of disinformation distributed about the census, and you can think of all kinds of things that could come out and, and, and not uh, get people to respond. Um, another, another issue is what is ICE going to do during the census? So one of the things the Census Bureau is gonna do is they're gonna send out a lot of mobile vans to local communities to help them be counted. Um, so what would, what would happen if ICE followed those mobile vans around? The census isn't secretive about holding a partnership event. What would happen if ICE shows up at those partnership events? Um, we don't know what ICE is going to do. Hopefully they will, they will ease up a little bit. Um, and then, you know, what happens if there are serious undercounts in the 2020 census? What's the remedy? Um, there's, there are people thinking about remedies. Uh, there will probably be some lawsuits about that if there are serious undercounts. Um, this is something that uh, we don't have um, time to talk about. The Census Bureau is using a new way to protect the tabular data that they put out. It's called differential privacy. And believe me, we don't have time to talk about differential <laughs> privacy. But the big, the big issue here with differential privacy is that it's going to limit the amount of data that comes out compared to previous censuses. And it's also going to put some uncertainty into the data that is going to be measured and uh, made available. So now the redistricting data will come out and there'll be some idea about the uncertainty in it. I don't know how that's going to play out, but it's going to be new. And of course, there could be new litigation over the 2020 census. I worked on the 1990, the 2000 census, and the 1980 census, and there, were, there was litigation involved in all of those censuses. 2010 seemed to be the first census without 
major litigation. We'll see what happens in 2020. So how can you help? Um, I think you've heard a lot about how you can help, so I won't go into that, except to say that I think the biggest threat to a good census is going to be a disinformation campaign. Uh, and I'm pretty sure there's going to be one. If you want to play with someone's democracy, then you undermine the census because the census is the cornerstone of the democracy. So there are going to be attempts to, um, to spread disinformation about the census. And what you can do is make sure that if you hear strange rumors about the census, one, you, you remind people that, that that's not the census. Two, you can refer them to the Census Bureau so they can, they can uh, take some action. Um, so, so here are, are, are a couple resources. One is the census webpage, which is fabulous um, on the 2020 census. The other one, they, they, they've launched something about rumors. So here, you can go look and see what, what are rumors that the Census Bureau is aware of at the census. Um, that's the Los Angeles Regional Census Center phone number, but you can get a lot more information about how to help the Census Bureau from the census staff that are here. They'll, they'll give you a lot more information. So that's it. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you, Director Thompson. So we got about a little more than five minutes for questions. We're going to have two folks uh, with microphones, and so if anybody has any questions, if you'll if you'll take questions. One of the things that you said was about ICE following. Uh, so is there nothing that can be done about that? I mean, will like the project managers tell them to turn around and not go? or uh, Because that seems like a pretty big issue of ICE is following these trucks around. Uh, that is a really big issue if, if ICE decides to do that. The Census Bureau can't tell ICE what to do. The Census Bureau won't count someone with anyone around. So they, they won't do an enumeration if someone's standing there. Either ICE or, or a partnership or, or a local partner. The Census Bureau believes that it's just really important to maintain the integrity and the privacy of the census. But they can't tell I, ICE what to do. They don't have that authority. So it's an, it's an issue. Uh, could you comment <clears throat> a little bit in more detail <clears throat> regarding the executive order that the president issued in July, uh, uh, acknowledging that the census, that the citizenship question is not going to be uh, a question, and the use, however, of administrative records uh, to perhaps reconstruct uh, citizenship and then incorporate it into the census, and is that tied into the Maryland litigation that you referred to? Uh, sure. So that is tied into the Maryland litigation right now. Um, so when the citizenship question was first proposed, the Census Bureau recommended to uh, Secretary Ross that the most accurate way to produce the data was to use administrative records if they had to produce it. Um, Secretary Ross ignored that recommendation and ultimately um, was found to be arbitrary and capricious. So the Census Bureau had done, had done some really good research that showed that they could actually produce data using administrative records uh, for citizenship. Um, the issue in the executive order was that it explicitly said it should be used for redistricting. There are a lot of concerns that citizenship data could be misused for redistricting. Now, on the other hand, there are cases where the Department of Justice has used citizenship data to show that there's been discriminatory redistricting. So for example, you could draw what, what appears to be a majority Hispanic district, but because uh, non-citizens can't vote, it could really be a minority Hispanic district. So that, that, that's, not, that's not proper either. So there are uses for the citizenship data. The citizenship data right now is available 
from the American Community Survey, it's available down to what's called census block groups levels, which is, which is, which is pretty good. Um, so that, that, that's basically the basis of the lawsuit, is that it shouldn't be used for, for redistricting. Yeah, you mentioned disinformation campaigns. Have, in your experience with the Census Bureau, has this been done either on an organized or individual level before? And the second part, of course, is are there, are there penalties for uh, uh, anybody who gets caught uh, doing this uh, kind of disruption? Uh, so th th those are good questions. So there wasn't really an organized attempt to spread disinformation about the decennial census. In fact, the first time it was really organized that we saw it was in 2016. So it's a new phenomena, and the idea is how do you get ready to deal with it? You know, there's, I'm sure there's gonna be disinformation again in the 2020 election. It's probably gonna take a, diff a different form. And how do, you, how do you get ready for it? So. That, that's, that's going to be the big issue for the Census Bureau is, you know, I think they're doing everything right. They've got partnerships with Facebook. They've got partnerships with Twitter. A lot of the other, IT, you know, Silicon Valley IT companies, social media companies to work with them to try to combat this. And in terms of penalties, um, <laughs> there, there, there might be, but it would be very hard to catch someone who's doing it from outside the United States, for example. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's very hard to actually uh, find out who, who exactly is doing the disinformation. I was actually going to ask that question, uh, if you talk to Mark Zuckerberg about this. Um, I, I would also ask, do you have the support of other federal agencies in fighting disinformation? And then also, you mentioned sort of state cooperation as a possible uh, barrier. Is do you see? Um, are there? Is that a big problem? Is there just Alabama that's a problem? And uh, is that a new also a new problem, or has that been a true over the history? So, when I was at the Census Bureau, we had not approached the social media companies. Since then, the Census Bureau has approached the social media companies and has some good partnerships with them. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, there were always some concerns about not counting, about not counting illegal residents, um, but they were never formalized into a lawsuit. Um, right now, the, the, the only state that is suing is Alabama. Uh, there might be other states that would be happy to see Alabama win. Um, there's also been talk of drawing districts based on citizens only. Um, in fact, if, as part of uh, the litigation against the citizenship question, what came out was that a Republican redistrictor had done an analysis of Texas and showed dramatic swings in the way districts would appear if citizens only were, were used to draw districts. So the citizenship data will be available right now, and um, it could be used by some states to try to draw districts based only on citizens, which would, of course, be litigated. But again, the potential is there to do that. Hello. I just want to follow up on the question regarding ICE. Um, in 2010, did the administration suspend ICE raids during the um, census period? The well, yes and no. So for both 2000 and 2010, the Bureau had a informal agreement with, you know, when I, in 2000 was INS, but with the, the immigration enforcement that they would keep away from Census Bureau events. They would not stop enforcing the law, but they wouldn't, you know, come to a Census Bureau event and do a raid. That, that the Census Bureau would be, yeah, would be able to conduct their business apart from uh, the INS. And I don't know if such an arrangement's been reached in 2020. And then my second question was regarding the cost of counting. What's the average cost to count a person? 
As we think about funding, do we know what that cost is? So, um, what you could, what one, what some people do is they look at the allocation for the state, and I put up a number there, and they divide it by the state population and say this is what every person represents in terms of money. But the cost the cost of enumerating the people right now is somewhere around $15 billion for 2020. Um, it's not clear if the Census Bureau is going to spend all that money at this point, but that's what the projected full cycle cost is. And, uh, and you know, you take 330 million people and divide it into that, that's the cost per person. But it costs a lot more for the non-response follow-up than for the self-response. Um, it's, it's the biggest part of the census, $15 billion. I mean, there, there's, the, there's what you pay the enumerator, but then there's the infrastructure you have to build up. So it probably represents maybe 10 billion, 10 billion of the 15 billion, something, something of that order of magnitude. So it, it's really expensive to do that operation. And that's why the more you can get people to self-respond, the less expensive it'll be and the, the the more accurate the census will be. Sweet. We've got one final question, and then we're going to go to a three to four minute, five minute break before the uh, discussion panel. I had a question about the rumors email that you showed. Are they just, um, like if we come across a disinformation campaign and we email them, are they just collecting, or do you know if there's some kind of a rapid response team that will be oh, yeah, responding got, to those? I do know they have a rapid response team, so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So they're, they're, they're prepared, and it's not just for, for disinformation. I mean, when you do a census, lots of issues come up, and they, they, in each census, there's been a rapid response team um, that, that's, that, that's ready to deal with, with virtually any issue. Great, thank you. Another round of applause for former Director Thompson.